contributions, but uh, we'll see how far we get. Uh, so this is uh, the outline of, uh, of my talk. Uh, I'm going to, to speak uh, uh, about Lovir doctrines. Uh, these are like an algebraic gadget that were uh, introduced by, uh, by Lovir um, to, uh, to deal with, with logical theories and their possible extensions. And uh, and to be, to give a, a an algebraic characterization of of the uh, logical connectives and and quantifiers, uh, which uh, in this setting are specified by uh, certain adjunctions, uh, and uh, one of the features of of this uh, of this setting is that the uh, the models themselves are seen as morphisms between these doctrines rather than uh, uh, objects themselves. So they're more like relations between theories, uh, or in like uh, you can regard them as interpretations if you want from a broader perspective. Um, now, after introducing uh, a little bit this uh, uh, this framework, I will focus on um, uh, on a specific construction, which uh, in the in the form that I will present was given by Mili Maietti and Pino Rosolini, uh, and this is a quotient completion. Uh, in the sense roughly that it adds quotients of equivalence relation to a theory. And, uh, and we see that uh, this construction is uh, pretty peculiar in the sense it enjoys two universal properties depending on the, uh, um, on the context where we, uh, where we use it, let's say. Uh, so these two universal properties allow us to, to, uh, to regard theories with quotients as algebras for these constructions while uh, uh, theories with equality uh, without necessarily quotients uh, just as co-algebras for but for the very same construction uh, just on a different setting that i will uh, that i will explain um and and then one more thing that i would like to to touch upon is the fact that this uh, this same construction also can be seen as providing a, a sort of functorial version of uh Shela's TA construction that adds uh, eliminary uh, sorry, uh, imaginary elements to uh, to a theory. Uh, and finally, uh, if I have time, but I'm not sure, uh, I will tell you briefly how this can be lifted to growth indic vibrations, which are uh, uh, more general than than lower doctrines, which uh, like can be seen as proof relevant versions of this to, to some extent. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll see if we get to that. Um, okay, so let's begin with a. Uh, definition of what is uh, a doctrine. Uh, by the way, uh, you're very welcome to, to interrupt me anytime. Just keep in mind that uh, uh, I don't see the, the chat myself, uh, but hope someone is, uh, is looking at it. Uh, anyway, feel free to, to interrupt I'll, me. I'll, I'll monitor the chat uh, for you. So if anyone wants to ask a question in the chat, please feel free to do so and uh, I'll uh, monitor the chat. Thanks a lot. Um, all right, so uh, a doctrine uh, consists of a category with finite products, uh, which is also called the base category of the doctrine, and then a functor that goes from the opposite of the category to the category of posets. So we can regard it as a, uh, as a family of posets indexed on the objects of the category, uh, like this, for every object we get a poset. But the category also has arrows, uh, and, and these give rise to, to uh, monotonic functions between these posets, basically, uh, in, this, in this way. Um, and this action of the, uh, of the doctrine on the arrows is called indexing uh, along the, the arrow itself. Uh, as I said, these were introduced by Lovier uh, with uh, actually in a much richer version of, of this kind of structure. Uh, and then uh, a first sort of uh, uh, coherent analysis was given by Bart Jacobs uh, in, in his book. And then more recently, uh, Maietti and Rosolini have a series of paper uh, uh, studying certain forms of completions uh, uh, that apply to, to doctrines. Uh, and as I said, we're going to focus on one of these. Um, all right. So this is uh, what is a doctrine. It's very basic. Uh, but you can see like there is uh, the ingredients of, of a logic are there in the sense that the category accounts for the language and uh, the fibers for the, for the logic. So the, the order relation of the posit is supposed to be the consequence relation of the logic, uh, very roughly. 
but to be more precise, let's look at a concrete example. Uh, this is the, the doctrine that you get out of a, of a theory in some fragment of first order logic. Um, as I said, the only thing that we care for the moment is, uh, is the language and the consequence relation for the moment. Uh, so this doctrine is going to be uh, indexed on this category of contexts. And the context, contexts are like a, a list of variables um, uh, that are sorted. Uh, we are working with multi-sorted logics here. Uh, it just makes the, the, the whole things more convenient, actually. Um, and then the arrows themselves, they are lists of, uh, of terms uh, that are, again, also these terms are sorted uh, and they, uh, they have three variables uh, occurring in the, uh, in the domain context itself. Uh, so this, uh, each of these DI uh, has three variables contained in this, in this set. And this is what this declaration is, uh, uh, is saying. Uh, and then the morphisms are just lists of, of these uh, uh, terms in context uh, of the correct sort. So this is the, the base category. And uh, actually, to give the structure of a category, we need to specify what is the identity. This is like variable assumption, very easy. Uh, and composition, instead, uh, is just given by substitution of uh, terms into other terms. Uh, so you, you replace the variables, the, the y variables, with the terms coming uh, from from the list S, and these terms will have three variables in their own domain, uh, which is this set one set. Well, this should be a different index, perhaps set K. Uh, that's a typo, sorry. Uh, but anyway, this see that's the idea. Um, and of course, these these terms will depend on the kind of uh, of function symbols that we have in the uh, in our language. Uh, but there are certain errors that are always there and these are those given by projections like product projections and uh, and their combinations which in in this setting of uh, of the syntactic doctrine uh, they are just variable declarations like uh, this term in context here which is just uh, taking the the variable x1 and forgetting about the variable x2 this is what uh, this arrow is doing um, and as I said, these kind of errors are always present independently of the kind of uh, theory that we are considering. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in the abstract setting also, we can regard the product projections as, uh, as variables themselves. That's the, the, the basic idea. Um, okay, so this is the, the base category. And then the fibers, uh, so the poset over a certain context is given by the Lindenbaum-Tarski algebras of the uh, formulas uh, that have three variables in that context. And uh, the order, as I said, is the consequence relation. This should be uh, pretty familiar. Uh, and finally, it remains the action of the doctrine on the uh, arrows, the re-indexing, as we called it. And this is given by substitution of uh, a list of terms, uh, which is an arrow in the base, into a formula, which is an element in the fiber, right? Uh, and this action notice that goes uh, the other way around with respect to the uh, to the direction of the of the morphism of the arrow t. So here we uh, um, we're going from s prime to s, while the action uh, the indexing action is going from formulas in context s to formulas in context s prime, and that's just because we are substituting. Uh, into the variables x1, xn, terms that have three variables from uh, y1, ym. Uh, this is why the, the thing is going the other way around. And in particular, if we look at the, um, um, at the arrow that we considered before that forgets one of the variables, uh, we get that this action is, uh, is basically weakening the context of the formula alpha, adding a variable which does not occur in alpha. Um, and uh, right, and this action is, is, uh, is called weakening. In more general, uh, whenever uh, uh, we have a reindexing along a product projection in an arbitrary doctrine, uh, we're going to regard it as a, uh, as a weakening in the sense that we add uh, additional variables to the context that do not appear in the, 
the formula itself. Um, okay, so this is the uh, the basic idea on how we can uh, encode uh, logical theory as a as a doctrine. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, of course, other examples in the sense that, uh, I mean, one of the aspects of doctrine is that uh, um, we have both the syntax and the semantics living uh, inside there, in a sense, uh, because, uh, right, also, uh, if you look at the, at the subset of a given set, uh, this will give us uh, a doctrine called the power set doctrine. Uh, and this will be, of course, instrumental in the usual uh, um, in the usual semantics of of uh, first order logic. Um, and in this case, uh, so here the posets are those of of subset of a given set, and here indexing is given by taking counter image. And a relate, related example is is given by uh, exponentiating a power set by a given set. So these are uh, functions which values in the, in the poset, uh, and here the action is given by precomposition. Um, and uh, and finally, if you if you take a category with finite limits, you can also look at the subobjects of a given object. And in fact, the first example is a particular case of uh, of the second. If you take H to be the the poset with two elements. And is also an example of the third one if you just look at the subset of the uh, sorry subobjects in the category of sets. Um, all right, but uh, yeah, all this is very poor in the sense that we have uh, uh, no logical connectives, no constants, nothing. Uh, so let's uh, see how we can uh, consider richer logics. Um, and uh, so we begin with uh, adding finite meets. Uh, in uh, uh, in each fiber, uh, and we also require that this reindexing uh, preserves them. Recall that reindexing is substitution of terms into formulas, so it makes sense to to require that it preserves the conjunctions. And and we call such doctrine uh, primary. Basically, that's a logic with conjunctions and uh, and the top element. Uh, and you can go. Uh, you can you can add uh, little by little every uh, uh, every other logical connective that you like um, up to uh, uh, having a heighting algebra say or a boolean algebra if you prefer uh, and you can also specify the the quantifiers by requiring uh, the existence of of certain adjoints to their indexing along this product projection. So the idea is that we call that the product projection uh, is like uh, uh, forgetting a variable and the indexing along this is like weakening. In this case, weakening along A, adding a, a dummy variable from A, let's say. Uh, and uh, so what does it mean to have a joins to this? Uh, now this is expressing the fact that the existential is left adjoint to indexing along this uh, weakening. Uh, and the universal quantification is right adjoined to this uh, weakening. And, and what the adjunction relations are telling us is basically is that we have a bijection between these two home sets. Uh, so this is the home set of this poset and uh, consists of the arrows from this phi to this uh, weakening of psi. Uh, and uh, but of course, the, the home sets of a poset are pretty trivial. So it's, it's just the order relation. So either there is one or uh, it's empty. Uh, they contain at most one element. Uh, so we can rewrite these two in uh, more familiar terms as follows. And uh, if you look at the, at the left-hand side, for example, you see that this, uh, this interderivability basically encodes the elimination introduction rules for the existential quantification. Uh, so for example, uh, one direction is telling us that to conclude psi from uh, an existential statement, it's enough to conclude psi assuming that we have an x satisfying phi. That's the elimination rule of the, uh, of the existential quantification. And uh, right, so in this way, uh, uh, with these adjunction relations, we can uh, encode the uh, the basic rules characterizing the the, the two form of, of quantification. Um, 
and notice that also all the propositional structure, since it's, it's given by limits or co-limits, uh, they can also be expressed as, as adjunctions. Uh, so this was the uh, one of the basic insights of Lovier uh, that recognized how uh, all these logical structures can be can be given as adjunction to certain reindexing functors. Um, and yeah, so basically this is all due to him. Um, okay. So uh, there is one more uh, class of doctrines, uh, uh, which like this will be one of the main characters in the second part. And it's, uh, it's a doctrine uh, which is called elementary. And these encode logics with equality. Uh, so we require it to be primary. So already we have conjunctions and top elements. And in the spirit of Lovier, we formulate this as requiring certain left adjoints to reindexing along this uh, these arrows here, which are like parameterized diagonals. So we're duplicating the, the element in A uh, with uh, keeping this parameter I. Uh, now to, to unfold this and to actually relate it to the usual uh, or more familiar uh, notions of equality, uh, uh, let me give you this, this proposition, which characterize an elementary vibrations in terms of these three properties. So it says that uh, this doctrine here is elementary if we have a family of elements like this which live in the fiber over a product of an object with itself that is uh, reflexive substitutive in the sense that basically uh, all the all the predicates are invariant with respect to this binary relation uh, and finally productive uh, basically is is telling us that uh, uh, or you can prove from this that uh, the equality on a product uh, is the product of the equality, is the pointwise uh, equality. That was the last condition it's telling us. Um, and now that you have this characterization, you can ask, well, okay, how do we uh, construct the left adjoint out of this family uh, of equality predicates? And the answer is here. You take this conjunction here, um, uh, which notice is also what appears here in the uh, uh, in the premises of this uh, substitutivity. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. Um, and now you can see that this uh, this adjunction, as before, it's like a, a, a bijection between home sets, and home sets are just consequences relations in, in full sets. Uh, so what happens is that uh, we have this uh, equivalence, uh, which uh, um, yeah, I hope you will agree with me. It, uh, it characterizes uh, equality as well. Like in the previous case, from here you can uh, you can extract all the uh, usual rules for uh, for the equality. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's look at uh, like some more uh, concrete examples, like uh, what we need. Uh, on the previous examples to to have this additional structure that we that we've just seen. Uh, so uh, well, in the case of the syntactic doctrine, it's pretty immediate. Uh, you need the logical structure that we uh, uh, that we want to capture, basically. So uh, uh, a doctrine, the syntactic doctrine, for example, is elementary when the theory has a top element, conjunctions, and equality predicates. Um, and uh, in the case of of the uh, of the doctrines of, of functions valued in a, in a poset, uh, it all depends basically on the structure of the poset itself. And and if you want uh, first of the logic, then you need the poset to be a complete Heiting algebra or a complete Boolean algebra. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, in particular, you get the, the powers of doctrine in this way, which is both first order and elementary. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, the, the case of subobjects, you will have that it's it's always elementary. So the idea is that the equality predicate is uh, is the the diagonal, which is a subobject of the of the product of an object object with itself. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to, if you want a, a first order subobject doctrine, then you need to consider an elementary topos or anyway, uh, like a richer. Uh, kind of doctrine. Um, 
I mean, you don't need all the things in an elementary topos, but it's a, uh, it's a usual uh, it's a usual uh, framework to to consider. Um, okay, so uh, now that we have uh, all these doctrines. Uh, it's time perhaps to consider uh, what is a morphism. So I will be quite brief on this uh, since, I mean, these are not that these are not interesting. It's just that uh, uh, perhaps they play a, a secondary role in what I want to say. Uh, but let me just uh, observe that. Uh, so a morphism of doctrines consists of two, of two guys. One guy is a functor between the underlying categories and the functor is supposed to preserve product. Uh, Basically, uh, it's, it's like saying that it's preserving the, the variable assumptions. And, and then the second guy here, this G hat, is a natural transformation from P to this other composite. Uh, and uh, um, basically, uh, you can think of this, of this functor as interpreting the language uh, of C into the language of T. And, uh, and this natural transformation here instead as uh, interpreting the, the formulas, the, the predicates. It's mapping elements in here to elements in R over the translated language. Um, that's why we, uh, we consider the composite uh, G bar and R. Um, okay, uh, so this is very general. And, but in fact, if you, if you take a first order theory and you look at the morphisms into the power set doctrine, that preserved this first order structure, then you get that these are precisely the model Salatarsky, the usual uh, structures that you have in model theory. Uh, but as I said, I mean, it, it actually provides a more general uh, notion of model. So for example, the morphisms that preserve the first order and the elementary structure from this syntactic doctrine into the, um, into the, the subobject doctrines of the effective topos, uh, these are, uh, realizability models of the of the original theory um, and uh, yeah so these are just two uh, weak examples and and then we also have a notion of a morphism between uh, interpretations <clears throat> so I mean in, in uh, classical model theory you have a notion of morphism between structures uh, that's the notion of elementary embedding and uh, and again this is can be seen as a as a a uh, more general version of that for uh, like what happens if you uh, if you try to do the same in this more general framework and and you can recover the notion of elementary embedding uh, uh, when you consider a, a theory which is classical and with equality so in this case uh, uh, you already know that it preserves validity uh, if you know it's classical and with equality you can also reflect it so that's uh, uh, that's what happens with elementary embeddings. Um, okay, so this is uh, uh, basically what I wanted to say about the morphisms. Uh, and just to, to keep in mind that, uh, so I'm going to speak mostly about doctrines, so about the objects of, uh, of these two category. Um, uh, but actually all the things I'm gonna say, they apply to the, to the two categories as a whole, so to uh, to the theories themselves, to the models, and to the interpretations of the, uh, or to the translations of a model into another one, uh, all at once. Um, okay, so let's look at the second main character of this talk. Uh, these are doctrines with quotients. Uh, and here we start uh, assuming that, um, that the doctrine is elementary. So we have a theory with equality. And we say that it has quotients uh, if uh, basically uh, it has an arrow that behaves like the quotient for this given equivalence relation. And this happens for every equivalent equivalence relation. Um, where of course the, the notion of equivalence relation is expressed in the logic of, of P. Uh, so the first condition is telling us that it's reflexive. The second one is that it's symmetric. And, and finally that is transitive. All these are consequences in, in context. Um, and, and this condition here is telling us that uh, if we have uh, related elements, then Q is mapping them to uh, equal elements. That's why we need uh, an elementary doctrine to start with, uh, to speak of quotients. 
Um, and, uh, well, this initiality thing is what characterizes uh, a quotient, is the universal property of, uh, of a quotient. Um, okay, so now we have uh, these three uh, categories over the category of doctrines. This consists of uh, doctrines with quotients, which also are elementary. So they map here, if we just forget the, that we have quotients. And also, if we have an elementary doctrine, we can also forget about equality and just remember that we have conjunctions and we end up here in the uh, two categories of primary doctrines. And these arrows going down, they're just forgetting everything about the fact that, uh, except the fact that we have a, a doctrine. Uh, and as I said, all these guys, they, they work on morphisms and on two morphisms as well. It's just, I'm, I'm not mentioning that uh, explicitly anymore, I think. Um, okay, so these three, uh, uh, two categories are uh, the thing we're going to consider next, uh, together with these two functors, which are usually referred to as forgetful, uh, because they forget something, a piece of structure. Um, okay, and the one, the first thing I want to to describe you is this uh, quotient completion construction that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so in this form, which is given in this paper uh, of Maietti and Rosolini. Uh, and basically, you start with an elementary doctrine uh, and you construct another doctrine over a different category. And the base category, you, the new base category you consider is this category of equivalence relations, where the objects are the equivalence relations that, we, that we've seen before. So this row is uh, flexive, symmetric, and transitive. Um, and then the arrows are the, uh, uh, the arrows in the underlying category, C. Uh, the, the base category of E, uh, which are extensional. They, they must satisfy this, this property. So they must uh, map related elements according to rho to related elements according to sigma uh, in their codomain. Uh, so they need to, to preserve the, uh, the equivalence relation we're considering. Uh, and this is the, the, the base category. And then uh, if you take uh, an equivalence relation over an object A, then uh, the fiber of this new doctrine over this equivalence relation is going to be a subposet of uh, the fiber of the original doctrine over the underlying object. Uh, but it doesn't consist of all the elements here. You only take those that satisfies this condition, uh, which is known as descent condition, uh, which basically is telling you that alpha is invariant under rho, you see? If you know that alpha holds on some elements x1 and you know that <clears throat> x1 is, is related to x2, then you can also conclude that alpha holds on x2. Um, and uh, so if you, uh, if in place of rho, consider the uh, equality relation, then we saw that uh, this always holds for, for, for any predicate, right? Uh, but here we are taking an arbitrary relation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in general, this will be a, a subset of this, uh, sorry, a subposet of this, uh, of this guy here. Um, right. And this, uh, this doctrine that we, that we constructed is both elementary and with quotients. Uh, but I don't think I have the time to show you why, although it's, uh, it's not difficult, but, uh, yeah, I think maybe. Uh, it's best to to go on. Um, okay, and uh, and what Maietti and Rosolini also prove in that paper uh, is that this construct construction is providing a left adjoint to the forgetful functor, the first forgetful functor that we looked at before, the one uh, forgetting about the existence of quotients in a doctrine. So this is telling us that this construction is basically uh, uh, freely adding all the quotients to an elementary doctrine. So we are uh, uh, we are considering the the free theory with uh, with quotients uh, on a theory with equality. And uh, and this freeness basically uh, means the following. Uh, so uh, to say that there is an adjunction here is to say that uh, we have an embedding of the original doctrine into the completed one. Uh, 
this must preserve the elementary structure. And moreover, uh, if we have a, a let's say an interpretation of our uh, completed doctrine into any other doctrine with quotients, then we can pre-compose using this eta, and we get an interpretation of the original doctrine into this doctrine with quotients. It's just that we don't care about quotients anymore because he doesn't necessarily have them. Um, we only care about the elementary structure at this point. But now what the adjunction relation is telling us is that we can also go in the other direction and we actually get an equivalence of categories between the category of models of this completed doctrine into a doctrine with quotients and the category of models of the original doctrine into uh, the same doctrine with quotients. Um, so basically, this is telling us that we can, we, I mean, not only every, every model restricts, but it also expands to a model of this uh, extended theory with quotients. And the fact that we have an equivalence means that all the models here, they arise as an expansion of a model here. Uh, so we lose nothing, let's say, or we add nothing, uh, depending on, on where you look at the things. Uh, so one way to say this uh, um, is, uh, is a, in a way that the, this completed theory is a conservative extension of E. Uh, but again, keep in mind that this is an equivalence of categories. So uh, we're also looking at, uh, uh, um, at morphisms between these interpretations. Um, and uh, right, and this is a, a very basic uh, construction, very uh, important in categorical logic in the sense that it appears in uh, several forms of, of completions um, of, of different kinds. So in the sense that all these constructions can be factored through this uh, left adjoint here. Um, um, so you have uh, right exact completions uh, of uh, of like categories. So in particular, you know that uh, that all uh, exact categories give rise to uh, doctrines with quotients. Uh, you have the pretopos completion, which was used by Mackay and Reyes to show the the conceptual completeness of pretoposes. Uh, you have the tripos to topos construction, which is uh, a very general form to construct toposes, which are uh, not necessarily growth and uh, And then you have uh, a bunch of setoid models of extensional type theories. There is a very vast literature on this. And, um, and basically they, they all use this, this construction of, of freely adding uh, quotients. Um, okay, uh, but we not only have this uh, adjunction because what happens now that we have a uh, an adjunction like this, we can always look at the composite. Uh, like if we start from, from an elementary doctrine, we go to the completed one and then we forget that we have completed it. And uh, what happens is that you obtain a monad in this way that acts on, on this category here. And whenever you have a monad, you can consider the algebras for this monad and you get an adjunction uh, like in a, uh, canonical way and also in a canonical way you get a comparison functor here between this category and the category of algebras simply because this monad is defined to be the composite of these two functors that's how this canonical functor arises um, and now you can you can look at the, an algebra here and you can observe that what this algebra is doing is uh, is mapping uh, an equivalence relation to an object in the uh, in the previous doctrine. And this object uh, you can check is going to be a quotient for the equivalence relation you started with. Um, so you can actually show that this comparison functor is uh, itself an equivalence. This was shown by Davide Trotta in his PhD thesis. Um, so, right. Uh, um, with, this, uh, with this, we can really regard the, the, the the notion of quotients as being algebraic over that of, of equality. Uh, in the sense that we have a monad uh, that allows us to regard the doctrine with quotients as algebras for this, for this monad. Uh, okay. Um, 
now uh, if we go back to this uh, construction though um, um, I want to show you one thing in that uh, actually we started with a doctrine which is supposed to be elementary but in the whole construction we never use the fact that we have an equality predicate uh, in the sense we don't need an equality predicate to speak of equivalence relations we just need a top for the reflexivity we need a conjunction for transitivity but that's it uh, to speak of extensional errors we need no equality we just need the two equivalence relations that are given here and uh, and finally also to speak of of this descent data to give this descent condition is enough to have conjunctions we need knowing no equality uh, so this whole thing can be done for uh, for a primary doctrine instead of an elementary one and uh, you may wonder what happens in that case uh, and by the way this was first observed by Fabio Pasquale who also answered the question and and show that uh, in this way if we apply that construction to a primary doctrine then you obtain uh, as before an elementary one that we already knew uh, but uh, uh, if you um, if you pretend to be to to land only in the category of uh, uh, of elementary doctrines so you uh, you don't care about quotients for the moment then you can show uh, that uh, this contraction now is right adjoint to this forgetful functor. Uh, so before, let me go back here, this contraction, construction was left adjoint to the forgetful functor from quotient to equality. And now the same construction is right adjoint to the functor that forgets equality and only remembers conjunctions. Uh, so this is the second universal property of the construction that I was uh, referring to at the beginning. Um, and, uh, and now, as you can imagine, something dual to, to what we had before happens, so that uh, if we look at the composite of these two functors, we have an endofunctor on the category of, uh, of primary doctrines. Uh, but this is not going to be a monad. Now this is going to be a co-monad, uh, because the, the order of adjoints is, uh, uh, is the opposite. Uh, but now the rest is more or less the same. So also for a commonad, we have a canonical adjunction uh, in which the now the adjoints are in the same direction as this one. You see from co-algebras to primary doctrines, we go with the left one here. And in the other way, we go with the right. And, and again, because C is generated by this adjunction, we have a canonical comparison here. Um, and now this is the bit I contributed to, uh, together with uh, Fabio Pasquale and, and Pino Rosolini. Uh, we show that, uh, well, first of all, this commonad is lux idempotent. Uh, I'll tell you in a moment what that means. And secondly, that this uh, canonical comparison functor is, uh, is also an isomorphism between these two, two categories. Uh, so what is this telling us? Uh, what it means to be lux idempotent uh, so this is a, a rather technical condition, but basically uh, uh, can be expressed as saying that uh, if you give me a doctrine, then there is at most one co-algebra structure on, on that doctrine. Uh, or more precisely, if you have two structures, then you have a canonical isomorphism between the two. Uh, so in this sense, it's unique up to iso. Um, so this is what being lax and important is, is telling us. And the second thing uh, is basically it's telling us that, uh, as before, an elementary doctrine is the same as a coalgebra. So the, the coalgebra map itself is, is picking out the, the equality predicate as it was before for the, for the quotients. We, we have a choice of equality predicates. Um, so now if we put the two together, uh, we obtain uh, at most one co-algebra, so that means at most one elementary structure on each doctrine. And this means that being a, an elementary doctrine is a property of a, of a primary doctrine. There is at most one way in which a primary doctrine can be elementary. Uh, or if you want, uh, if, you, if you have a choice of, of equality predicates in, in a logic, then that choice must be unique. Uh, you cannot have two, 
different equality predicates. That, I guess, uh, makes sense. Um, I mean, something one should, should expect from equality. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, I still have a, a few minutes, right? You have about, uh, you have a little bit more than 15 minutes, I guess. Oh, wow. I have a lot of time. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, then maybe I can I can also speak a bit about coordinate vibrations. Um, okay, but uh, uh, first let's uh, uh, let's move to the to the third uh, item that I had uh, in the outline. Uh, that uh, that was uh, like the connection with uh, with this construction by Shela. Uh, so what I'm uh, what I want to 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 show you is that basically also um, uh, also, this construction by Shela can be seen as an instance uh, of this uh, commonal or of the quotient completion construction. Uh, and um, so, the um, um, let's say the, the original observation was made by by Neely Mackay, uh, and uh, who actually recognized that the Pretopos completion that he had defined together uh, with uh, Reyes uh, was basically doing the same as uh, uh, what this uh, construction by Shela was doing, uh, and this has been worked out in some details by by Harnik in this uh, in this contribution here. Um, uh, but as I said before, uh, we can uh, we can factor the Pretopos completion through the quotient completion that I uh, that was given by Mayet and Rosolini. The one that I described, uh, and and one might wonder whether uh, that step that adds quotients is is enough. Uh, so the reason now maybe it's it's time to to have a better look at what this uh, TA construction is. Um, so this uh, this thing here was introduced by by Shela to uh, to embed a theory into a theory that eliminates imaginaries. Uh, and this notion of elimination of imaginaries uh, was defined actually by Poisat in this uh, in this paper here. Uh, and the the idea is that a theory has elimination of imaginaries uh, if every model of T has definable quotients of definable equivalent relations. Uh, so I'm not sure if this can be also be taken as the as the definition. Um, but anyway, that's the the, uh, the rough ideas. And, and what Shela did was to construct this TEC uh, with these two uh, basic properties. Well, first it must eliminate imaginaries. Um, so it satisfies this condition above. And, and moreover, this TEC must be a conservative extension of, of this T. So the two must be, they must have the same models, let's say. Uh, and then, uh, then he used this in, uh, in his proof of the, of the Morales conjecture um but uh so the um uh, one gap here perhaps is that uh so the the theories shell was most interested interested in uh are actually classical complete theories uh so these are very strong theories from from our perspective of, of doctrines where uh, uh they tend to be very poor um and uh but the point is that uh, in the case of a, of a classical complete theory, uh, you can rephrase this, uh, this condition on the models of T internally. Uh, um, we could find this characterization uh, in the book by Hodges. <clears throat> and you can say that a first order theory, now you don't even need to know that it's classical. It's enough to have uh, the usual quantifiers. Uh, so you can say that it has uniform el elimination of imaginaries if uh, for every uh, binary relation which is provably reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, you can find uh, uh, a relation, so another sort P and a relation between the two that satisfies this condition, which essentially is telling us that P is a quotient uh, of this sigma, of A under sigma, uh, and this phi is uh, uh, 
is the quotient function or it's the graph of the quotient function if you prefer uh, this is what this uh, this formula is telling us uh, indeed you can check that if your syntactic doctrine has quotients then the original theory has an elimination of imaginaries uh, but it seems that having quotients is a bit stronger in the sense that here you require the existence of uh, an arrow in the base category so you need a term uh, that is, that behaves like a quotient function well here you just have a formula so if you have a term you can always consider the formula which is given by the graph of the term or seen as a function uh, but you cannot go the other way around necessarily uh, so having quotient seems to be stronger but anyway uh, you can you can find uh, a doctrine uh, that allows you to characterize uniform elimination of imaginaries in terms of quotients. And this is this uh, category here, uh, which was introduced by Mackay and Reyes. Uh, and uh, well, to those into the, cat the theory of doctrines, I can tell you that this is like the category of predicates of T. Um, and now if, if the theory is, uh, if T is, is nice enough, uh, um, then you can show that uh, T has uniform elimination of imaginaries if and only if the doctrine of sub, sub oh, sorry the doctrine of subobjects of this uh, category of predicates has uh, has quotients. Uh, so you can yeah you can characterize the this property of T in terms of a property of a doctrine that you can construct out of out of T. Um, okay, and uh, but what I want to to actually tell you. Uh, is that uh, well? Now you can uh, you can also see this by yourself, uh, since uh, I've told you that if you have a doctrine with quotients, then the theory associated as elimination of imaginaries. Uh, then we know that the, that the, um, the theory that we obtain completing with quotients uh, well has quotients, so it has uniform elimination of imaginaries. And uh, by combining the, the two adjunctions that I showed you before, the two universal properties of this uh, um, of this quotient completion, uh, you can show that uh, this extension is also conservative in this very strong sense that you have an equivalence. Sorry, that you have an equivalence of categories between the the uh, first order models with equality of this uh, doctrine with quotients and the first order models with the quality of the original uh, doctrine you started with. Um, so you not only have the same, uh, the same models, but also the interpretation, the transformations between these models are going to be uh, the same. Um, right. And as I said, uh, you need uh, basically uh, most of the, of the things I, I mentioned about the adjunction before. Uh, in particular, you need to know that the two adjunctions are uh, tightly related uh, in a sense that the left adjoint and the right adjoint uh, in the two cases are given by the same construction. Uh, so this can be expressed, for example, by saying that the, the, um, the unit of both adjunctions is the same in the category of elementary doctrines. Uh, and yes, this... Uh, uh, this morphism J here. Uh, and another thing that you need to know is that uh, the powers of doctrine has quotients. This uh, is easy to see. And this means that you have an algebra uh, as, we, as we saw at the beginning. Having quotients is, so this algebra is, is picking out a quotient for each equivalence relation in, in the powers of doctrine. Um, and now this algebra is going to be uh, actually the co-unit of the second adjunction so when you combine it, uh, and, and it's, it's what you need to, to go backwards. So when you combine it with the unit, you use the triangular identities of the, of the junction, and you know that uh, basically that you end up where you started with if you, if you go back and forth. Um, OK, so this, this is what I, I mean. And, and as I said, in, in this sense, we can regard this uh, this quotient completion construction as a, uh, as a functorial version of the elimination of imaginaries in, in this sense. Uh, 
that uh, first it it acts on on theories on their interpretations and uh, uh, and the transformations between these interpretations uh, and also the conservativity uh, itself is uh, is factorial um, and I guess this is all I wanted to say about the elimination of imaginaries uh, but uh, yeah I'm not sure it's worth to 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 delve into something more difficult now maybe it's uh, maybe a good idea to stop here all right uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot uh, Jacopo uh, so thanks for this nice talk is there uh, is there a question for for Jacopo You can also ask the question in the chat and I will read it out loud. Or maybe there is a question in in Genova. Uh, it seems no. Yeah. But you should come here maybe. We have a question here. Uh, okay. What next? What's next? Yes. Oh, um, well, uh, uh, well, the next thing I wanted to to tell you, of course, was the how to to lift everything to to growth and vibrations, uh, and we've already done that uh, for. Uh, um, let's go back. Uh, for this setting here, uh, so we've we've lifted this this result to the case of, of growth and vibrations. Um, for what I told you before, what is missing is to lift this other conjunction to the case of growth and vibrations. Um, one thing is to understand what is a, uh, a good notion of quotient for, uh, for a groupoid, because that's what, what happens when you, when you move from, from doctrines to, uh, to vibrations is that you, uh, yeah. You need to replace the equivalence relations with group points. Yeah, that, that was my, my second question. So, what makes you think that you can do it with uh, closing vibrations? Like, what reasons do you have to believe that it works? Um, so, the, the, the question is is uh, what makes me think that uh, it can work with closing vibrations? Um, yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, that's a good question, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I guess it's, uh, uh, it's a bit of uh, of feeling how the things work in the uh, in the case of doctrines. Um, and um, yeah, the point is is rather uh, what additional assumptions you need to have in order for things to to work out. Uh, so one one thing is, for example, uh, I told you that in the case of uh, here it is. In the case of doctrines, we can characterize an elementary doctrine with these uh, three properties. Um, but these are no longer enough for characterizing elementary growth in vibrations. You need to, uh, to add one more thing. So, yeah, it's, mo it's more like what, what you need to add 